So, the evil spirit Batu started out as a giant flying kite with dangly bits on the end, and then when he fuses with Unalak, he becomes giant red devil version of Dr. Manhattan, and his spreading evil and spreading darkness across the world. That's that's him appearing in the physical world and stomping through the water like Godzilla, taking a couple of notes from Shyamalan's last airbender live action movie and just slowly raising a wave and then putting it back down and then just I was especially I was especially nonplussed by his approach towards the Avatar Aang statue. It would have made a much stronger impact if he'd taken a thing and just sort of thrown it around and then chucked it until it was broken up into a bunch of bits and pieces and fragments everywhere. But just no, he kind of pushes it like in a Nancy boy way, like, Ugh, I don't like you, Aang. It's just he picks up the statue and gently pushes it into the water. What's the point of that scene? Shouldn't he be crushing the statue to make a point? Or wouldn't it be a much stronger visual image to show he's bad, he's a bad evil villain if he broke it into a bunch of bits? That, that, that was pretty much the only scene where they unveiled uh, Batu's evil ultimate form that, uh, that really kind of bugged me. And then, another thing I want to bring up, something that, there's, there's one thing in the final four episodes that bugged me a little bit more than, uh, Batu and Unalak fusing, and that would be, in the heat of battle, Bolin decides that he's in love with Asuka again, it's just, she tormented him psychologically, emotionally. She abused him. He wanted to get away from her as far away as possible. It's just now he's running right back to his abusive lover, and it's just like, yeah, it's okay because she's fighting with the good guys now. And it's just no, that is not okay. I I'm probably overreacting to fiction here when I say this, but just. If you're going to patch up the relationship between those two characters, she has a lot of apologizing and character development to do. Those two are a worse matchup than what Mako and Korra were. Their circumstances, how they got together, and how they did patch up the relationship. I'd rather sit through the love triangle crap in book one again and I find that more believable than these two being a healthy, stable couple. I know they don't stay together, but just, that's one of the points that I wanted to bash my head against the wall about. It made no sense. She made him pull her and her twin Desna around and a rickshaw. She put a choker on him and forced him into marriage. She insulted him. She dominated him. And it's just, that's not excusable behavior. It is not. I just can't excuse that in the final four episodes. That's one of the biggest points I wanted to rant about. Just, no. Big, fat, no. Bolin would be better off with Ginger, the superficial and fickle movie star slash supermodel. He'd be better off with her than he would with Eska. Or, or at least that's that's my personal take on it. I mean, I'm not entirely averse to the idea. I just am in its current manifestation. I'd be okay with those two possibly rekindling their romance and getting back together. But after Eska had gone through some very major character development and learned to respect Bolin. In other words, he helped her become 
a functioning member of society that knew how to respect people, that didn't enforce her will. And she apologized to him, and it was a legitimate scene. Not in the heat of battle in a Romeo and Juliet kind of sense, but legitimate emotional development. Just, that's the only way I can really see it happening. I mean, I don't hate the pairing. I just hate how it play. I just hate how it's constructed right now. I just wanted to make that point clear. Other than that, though, I absolutely loved the finale for this show. Loved it. It was a bit rushed, but the part of me that loves Michael Bay brand explosions loved how this ended. The battle between Korra and Unalak. There was just the right amount of action, a whole bunch of epic bending, the kind of bending that was near the end of the season one finale, just in so many beautiful effects and illustrations and imaginative means for using the bending. It was great! And we got to see Bolin play the epic hero. I love that scene. About time that guy stopped being such an unsufferably dislikable douche and actually stepped up and played the uh, heroic, lovable mascot that we got to know in season one. And then, Boomy, Boomy getting some time in the spotlight. I was so pleased to see that because he is my favorite character in book two. He's hilarious. He is a riot. He, he could almost match up to Avatar The Last Airbender's Sokka when it comes to playing the comedy relief. And just how he took out the entire camp by a happy accident kind of deus ex machina. I loved it. That was great. That was great. That was wonderful. More Boomy. Boomy needs to make more appearances. And season three is greenlit and confirmed. More Boomy, please. And more Tenzin and Kaya. Those three were actually the strongest characters in the entirety of season two. I'll, I'll outright admit it. I, there were times where I wish those three were the main characters. I don't care that they're older and that they're out of my demographic and that I may not be able to relate to their problems as well as I could with the uh, main cast. They're three-dimensional characters. They play off of each other in really fascinating ways and you can definitely see their uh, parents reflected in them, especially Kaya. She's definitely Katara's daughter. She's kind. She's compassionate. She was the, she was the most level-headed of the two most of the time. I could see Katara shining through her, and yet she's her own character in her own right. It's just okay. I'm gushing about those three. Yeah, I was extremely pleased to see those scenes starring both Bolin and Boomy, giving them their shining moment in the sun. That was great! And then, just the finale itself, the... I'll admit that the ending was kind of an unexpected twist. It kind of showed, it showed great, a big turnaround in Korra's character. She's definitely a lot more wise, a lot more mature much more patient. There is boundless potential for her as a character now. She's pretty much the parallel between her and Juan, the uh, first Avatar, is that much more compelling now since she's the start of a brand new era. I, I love the ending where all the spirits were flying through the air and it was implied that this is an entirely new landscape. This is just this this environment has the same sort of story, storytelling potential as what the series did from the start and what the Avatar The Last Airbender setting had. Just think about it. Even despite the fact that some of the mythos and such were just thrown into your face and it's just like, just shut up and go with it was pushed, if there was enough time to develop and really explore this new world and its surroundings, if you had as much time to develop and explore that as you did with Avatar The Last Airbender, 
you'd have an incredibly compelling and interesting story where you could explore and dis define the mythos just a little bit more. To be honest, I kinda... I'm kinda ready to see Korra take a bow or take a route similar to what we would have liked to see with Juan and just go exploring, just sort of start helping to starting help the spirits acquiesce to their new environment. There's still quite a few challenges that would come with that. It'd actually be really interesting to see her story told in as... well... interesting a way as what Wands was. In other words, actually develop the time she spends wandering the uh, rest of the world and traveling with these spirits, maybe even starting to uh, resolve a couple of scuffles between humans and spirits, because I highly doubt that things are just going to mesh and be perfectly copacetic and utopian, as what the ending might have uh, alluded to. Heck, there's even some of the issues and leftover conflicts after uh, resolving the war with the Fire Nation and Avatar The Last Airbender, those are picked up and touched upon in uh, the companion comics The Promise and such. I haven't necessarily checked those out, but I have seen comments and such online sort of briefly touching on that that was taking place. In all honesty, I... I, kind of, I really do have a love-hate relationship with the ending for book two. I will say that book one was a lot stronger when it comes to villain and resolution, but book two's ending has a lot in its favor. It has a lot of credit. It introduced a stunning new environment, a, a great new setup for the uh, next season. There were lots of great visuals in both the fight itself, just a whole bunch of creative ways to set up the bending. There were uh, moments in the sun for some of the most unexpected characters. And those really do kind of shift out the balance between uh, what I'd have to gripe about and what I absolutely loved about it. I would absolutely love to see season three explore the spirits just a little bit more. Have Korra go on a yeah, spiritual journey similar to what Juan did and really explore the spirit world or even other locations within the world. Helping the uh, helping humans discover and uh, get to know the spirit world and even just helping spirits get reacquainted with the human world. There's a lot of potential in that. When I uh, first got done watching after the final four episodes, I kind of sat there wondering what more stories are there to tell? And then when you really think about it, there is a grandiose amount of potential. Just not necessarily, my immediate response isn't in an action adventure sense, but in exploratory philosophical sense. What sort of what sort of challenges will Korra have to face with their new role? That's... That is a huge role to take on in and of itself. She may not be the bridge, but she is trying to continue and further peace. She's a... She's a universal mediator. That presents another challenge in and of itself. It's similar to the challenge Aang faced in trying to go across and, uh... Sort of start sewing together, uh the bond between the Fire Nation and all the other nations after the war had ended. There'd still be quite a bit of work to do there. It's similar to that. There's probably quite a few spirits who still feel slighted and not quite open to human interaction. What if... Actually, I'm going to bring up a plot point that I discussed with my uh, brother a speculation he made before Book 2 even came out and it was announced that uh, spirits was the theme. He wondered, what would it be like if Korra met up with Ko the Face Stealer? What if you had a plot point that now that the human and spirit worlds are intertwined, Ko could very well find a way to break his bonds and find easy access into the human world and start causing chaos again. Not just him, but what about the uh, big spider dude that Tenzin ran into? Who says that the spider wouldn't mistake 
humans wandering into the spirit world as quote-unquote lost souls and dump them into that frightening kind of disorienting mist. What if there are still going to be some sort of imbalance between humans and spirits. There's going to be nasty spirits and there's going to be hateful humans. It's going to be similar to the case of what Juan was facing. It's just Cora is going to be facing it in a much different respect. I'd actually be really interested to see if they do approach what exactly happened to Unalak after the final battle. What if what if he can be redeemed to some sense? It was kind of implied that he honestly thought that what he was doing was right, and in a sense, Korra did bring his vision to life by opening the spirit portals. What if Unalak could be ultimately redeemed by being separated from Batu, and then he could give Korra advice on how to help mesh the uh, tension and prejudices between the humans and the spirits. This would be a great place for him to step back in. Because his ultimate goal was to combine the worlds. And who says he necessarily would think that achieving this goal would be to wipe all the humans out? Of course, that, that was a bit ambiguous. He was a really poorly constructed villain. But I would not be averse to him showing up again to help Korra out with the, another task like that. That's another really interesting plot point that you could take. And it'd redeem and refine his character to a certain extent, too. And there's still untapped potential with the whole dark avatar concept as well. What if what if Unalak did start up a new cycle? He may not have... He was never necessarily completely extricated from Batu. What if there's now a dark avatar? That must kind of rolling into true conspiracy theorist territory, but I just thought I'd throw that idea out there since it kind of seemed interesting. Well, this wasn't necessarily a review. It was more just a collective bunch of opinions and speculation about the season two finale and my predictions on what I think would be an interesting plot point or what I think might happen and that's really all I have to say on it. If any other speculations or topics pop up though I may very well make another video about well more specified and narrowed topics probably more in uh, depth and uh, expanding on certain ideas rather than just a bunch of tangents and miscellaneous ideas.